Following the American Civil War, the United States of America entered into a new era categorized by weak political leadership, massive industrial growth, and lots of corruption. This era was known as the Gilded Age. So let's start with the first president of the era, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant was probably the most famous American at the time, overwhelmingly popular in the North, not popular at all in the South, at least with the white South. This was the man who had defeated Robert E. Lee. This is the victor of Vicksburg. This was the man who helped save the Union. And when the Republicans were looking for a nominee in 1868, it made a lot of sense to nominate Grant, and he gladly accepted. Even though he had no political experience and probably lacked a lot of political skill because he governed like a general, meaning he liked to give orders, he expected them to be followed, um, even if he didn't surround himself with the kind of people who uh, he could he could trust people of poor character and even if he himself was a man of high character the people he surrounded himself were not and that's really going to come to categorize not only his presidency but politics of the era in general before we talk about corruption that categorized the grant administration and gilded age politics in general let's talk about another confounding issue of the time and that is civil rights for african americans Following the Civil War, slavery was abolished, the 14th Amendment granted the right to citizenship and equal protection to all Americans born in this country, and the 15th Amendment was going to protect the right to vote for all men in the country. But Grant's got a problem down in the South, and that is the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. The KKK was a secret terrorist organization that was founded right after the end of the Civil War that was designed to essentially prevent African Americans from being treated as full citizens to prevent them from doing things like owning property, and most certainly to prevent them from exercising their fundamental right to vote. And because of this, Grant, working with Congress, is going to uh, utilize a series of force acts to break the Klan, to prosecute Klan leadership, to round them up, and effectively destroy the Klan by the early 1870s. And for a brief period of time, the federal government in the early 1870s is going to use its power to guarantee protection for African Americans in the South, even if those protections in the grand scheme of history will not be very long-lived. But it is corruption, after all, for which the Gilded Age is well known. Political corruption, corporate corruption. You have things like the Fisk and Gould scheme that involved people trying to corner the gold market. You had local corruption. You had state-level corruption. Uh, but probably the thing that encapsulates it the best is the urban political machine. Political machines were the organizations that ran political parties. They decided who got to run for office. They, in many ways, decided who would be elected by guaranteeing votes for candidates, uh, particularly from uh, immigrant communities. Uh, they would then, once they had people in office, they would use those people in office to send government contracts their way and decide where new roads went and all those sort of things and use that influence to essentially make money, to line their own pockets. The best example of this is Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall was the democratic political machine in New York. And it, like all political machines, was run by a political boss, in this case, William Boss Tweed. Tweed decided everything in New York and at one point became so big and so powerful that, as this cartoon suggests, even the law could not touch him. So the point being that when we talk about the corruption of the Grant years or some of the other years, really corruption is the coin of the realm for the Gilded Age, be it at a state, local, or federal level. There isn't a whole lot of evidence that Ulysses S. Grant himself was corrupt, but he was no doubt naive and loyal to people that he should not have been loyal to. Throughout all of Washington, D.C., corruption ran rampant. There was corruption in Congress. We can see this with the Credit Mobile scandal, which involved a fictional uh, construction company that, was, that got government contracts to build a railroad and bribed people in Congress with stock in that company, and then they overcharged to send up the value of the stock and lead to massive profits, whether it be the whiskey ring or the Indian ring in which members of the Grant administration 
uh, used their influence to take bribes in order to allow, in some cases, companies to evade taxes or to have a monopoly on certain trade. In short, there are people in both the legislative branch and the executive branch who are making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and they're doing it in unethical ways. And oftentimes, it's taxpayers who are fitting the bill. It's no doubt because of the rampant corruption that many liberal Republicans uh, really couldn't stomach the idea of supporting Grant. And so there was this temporary odd alliance in 1872 in which liberal Republicans tried to join with Democrats to nominate someone to run for president. And the person that they wound up choosing was an unconventional choice, um, a newspaper man by the name of Horace Greeley. Um, ultimately, it doesn't work. Greeley is a weak candidate, not really a national figure. Uh, and Grant, again, has incredible support, particularly among African Americans. After all, he had just worked to crush the Klan. Um, and ultimately, Grant is going to be reelected in 1872. Probably a good thing, frankly, because poor Mr. Greeley, not long after the election takes place, but before the electoral count actually is counted, Mr. Greeley is going to pass away. So that really would have created a bit of a constitutional crisis uh, had he won. But nevertheless, Grant is reelected in 1872, and his second term, like pretty much the second term of every president, isn't exactly going to go very well. What's going to doom his second term? Well, it's not just more revelations about scandal and corruption. It's an economic depression, a panic, the Panic of 1873, which led to a depression that lasted for years. In short, the depression was caused because overexpansion of railroads and factories and mines. There was so much industrialization during the Civil War and in the years immediately following that lots of banks and state governments were giving money to build far too many railroads and far too many factories and far too many mines. Railroads that really didn't have any need to be built and mines that didn't have any need to, to, be, to be dug and factories that weren't producing enough goods for the market to bear. As a result, in 1873, there is massive uh, uh, business closure. Banks go under, thousands of business fail, and there's massive unemployment. You know, we're talking about double digits, 13, 14 percent unemployment. And the truth is, at this time, there isn't really much that the federal government is equipped to do. And frankly, there's not a whole lot that your average American or the best thinkers of the time would have recommended that the federal government do. They're not going to use some sort of stimulus or anything like that. So rather, the debate becomes, how do we handle the monetary situation? And there's two groups of people. Generally speaking, there are those people who are in debt, uh, who want to create inflationary policies. They want more money in circulation. In fact, some of them want the government to continue to issue greenbacks, which were paper money, not backed up by any gold, um, that, that had been issued during the Civil War. If, if there's more money in circulation, it makes it easier to pay debts, is the thinking. Now, banks, creditors, powerful business people, they don't really don't want this. They wanted hard money. They wanted money that was backed up by gold and silver. And Grant, it turns out, agrees with this. And when the debate then becomes, well, what kind of hard money? Just money that is backed up by gold or money that is backed up by silver? Again, if we've got two metals that are backing up our money, there's going to be more money in circulation. It's still going to make it lead to some inflation and in theory make it easier for people to get money to pay their debts but instead in what becomes known as the crime of 73 uh, silver is officially dropped from backing our money and we go on a whole gold standard there's known as the crime of 73 this debate about whether or not the american currency will be backed up by gold alone or gold and silver will actually, in the decades to come, be one of the more hotly contested issues of the day. One of the more interesting things about politics of the Gilded Age is just how loyal your average American voter was to their political party. And oddly enough, it had very little to do with policy. Republicans and Democrats really did not disagree 
on a tremendous amount of things. Today, we think about Republicans being conservative and having a certain amount of beliefs and Democrats being liberal or progressive, and they have these beliefs that are the complete opposite of Republicans. That's not the case in the 19th century. But people felt passionately about their political parties, and they supported them with loyalty. You can almost think of it like the loyalty that people have to college football teams. People who are fans of college football are often fans of a particular team because that's where they live. They grew up in Alabama or Texas or Ohio, and they're raised in families that support those teams, and so that's why they support them. Likewise, during the Gilded Age, the people who vote Republican or vote Democrat do so for cultural and regional reasons, far more than they would any policy. The Republicans are overwhelmingly the party of the North. They basically control the 16 northern states, the rural and midwestern states. The only areas of the North that they don't really support are the northern cities, which at that time were Democratic, based upon immigrants uh, coming into that area. The Republicans, by and large, controlled the presidency over several decades and the Senate. They, support, they were supported by industrialists and, and uh, older stock Americans, whereas Democrats, they were the party of the South, or at least the Southern White Man's Party, uh, who, of course, are going to exercise a lot of control in the decades to come. Uh, they control the House of Representatives, and the only place in the North, again, that they really have any sort of support are in those northern cities. So if you need to get elected, you're not really going to do it based upon some policy that you are going to articulate. Rather, they're going to use what it becomes the lifeblood of the parties, political patronage. Patronage is the idea that when a person or a political party is running for office, when they win, they then reward their supporters with government jobs. And if you're a governor, certainly if you're president of the United States, that's what you spend a lot of your time doing, is appointing people to dozens and dozens, hundreds and hundreds of political jobs. This is called civil service. And this patronage, the idea of giving jobs to my supporters, regardless of their qualification, really leads to, again, a lot of the corruption that we've been talking about earlier. One reason why there can be so much corruption is that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of people of both political parties that were not qualified. They were given the jobs they had because they supported a candidate who happened to win an election. Throughout the second half of Grant's administration, the rampant corruption going through all levels of politics became evident to a lot of people. And there were people on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, who did believe in civil service reform, trying to clean up the system. Let's take a look at the Republicans for a minute. There were two groups of people. There were the so-called stalwarts, the people who believe that the old system of using political patronage to get electoral support was the way to go. Uh, they're probably their most well-known spokesman time was a senator named Roscoe Conkley. Um, on the other half, uh, there was something called half-breeds. These were Republicans who they were Republicans, after all, but they believed in civil service reform. They, they believed that perhaps there ought to be less political patronage. Maybe there ought to be some merit involved in getting jobs. And they were, uh, had the, the voice of James G. Blaine, the governor of Maine. And the Republican Party in 1876 was really split. Are we going to be reformers or are we going to be stalwarts? And they couldn't really come to a consensus, so instead... They choose someone by the name of Rutherford B. Hayes to be their presidential nominee in 1876. Hayes was a pretty mediocre guy, but he had some things going for him. He was a, uh, he was a Civil War veteran and who'd served proudly. But probably most importantly, he's the governor of Ohio, and Ohio was a very important state, electorally speaking. So Hayes is going to be chosen to be the Republican nominee. He's going to go up against Samuel Tilden, the gov governor of New York. And the Democrats really think that because of all the corruption and that panic of 1873, they're going to have a chance to win. When Election Day comes, it is not clear who has won. It is clear that Samuel Tilden has more than 250,000 more votes than Rutherford B. Hayes. And he is one electoral vote away from getting 
the Electoral College victory. But unfortunately, the votes in several southern states were disputed. It was unclear which candidate had actually won. In Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, it was unclear whether the Republican or the Democrat had won. And both parties were trying to send their electors to uh, Washington to be counted. There was also a rogue elector out in Oregon as well. In short, whoever won these disputed electoral votes would win the presidency. If Hayes won all of them, and he would need all of them, he would win the electoral count uh, by one, one vote. It was unclear who had won. And for several months, uh, there was talk of installing Tilden as president or installing Hayes as president. There were talk of a second civil war. In the end, what Congress decides to do is to put together an electoral commission. There were 15 people on the commission made up of members of the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. There were eight Republicans and seven Democrats. And wouldn't you know, at the end of the day, when they voted, the eight Republicans outvoted the seven Democrats and decided that Hayes should be awarded all the disputed votes, thereby winning the presidential election by one electoral vote. This comes to be known as the Compromise of 1877. What really happened, happened behind closed doors. But here's what it appears maybe have, would have tipped the balance. There were still several states in the South that had federal troops stationed in them from the days of Reconstruction. Those troops were there protecting the rights of African-American voters. If African-Americans had the right to vote, overwhelmingly they supported Republican candidates, the party of Lincoln, the party of Grant. It appears that a deal was brokered that said that if the Republicans win the presidency and Hayes gets all the votes, one of the first things that the Hayes administration will do will be to end Reconstruction and will be to withdraw all federal troops from the South. Without federal troops in the South, the South can go back to doing things the way they'd always been doing things before the Civil War. This political cartoon of the era sums up that message. On one hand, we have President Grant with the support of federal troops uh, in a carpet bag uh, trampling on the South, using the strong federal government to enforce poli federal policies, policies like protecting the rights of all citizens. On the other hand, we have President Grant you can see those weapons have been turned into a plow, and they're plowing over those old policies. They're plowing over that carpet bag, and in the background there, you can see the cotton is once again being produced. And once again, African Americans, who are not slaves any longer, but they are yet again working on the large plantations, and the South's agrarian economy has returned to the way that many in the white South felt that it should It should be no wonder that after Reconstruction ends, as the years go by, this is when we get the idea of the lost cause, where history begins to be rewritten about the causes of the Civil War, about the heroes of the Civil War, and we see this idea that there was this noble cause of the Confederacy. Nowhere more is this a greater example of this than there at Stone Mountain, Georgia. There you go, where you have... Uh, the Confederate Mount Rushmore, essentially, with, with President Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. So Reconstruction comes to an end as a result of the Compromise of 1877, and much of the progress made during Reconstruction and during the Grant administration on behalf of African American rights will go away. When new Democratic majorities take over the southern governments they're able to do that because without the protection of federal troops black americans of the south are not ever able to exercise their right to vote these new democratic majorities are known as the redeemers because they were there to redeem or to make right what 
had been done against them. Of course, they cannot tell people of color they cannot vote because of the color of their skin. The Constitution is pretty clear, but instead we see Jim Crow take place. Legal codes of segregation uh, that separate people based upon the color of their skin into, into different areas of society, literacy tests, poll taxes, lots of things used to prevent African Americans from voting. And eventually, a few decades later, we actually see the Supreme Court endorsing this sort of stuff with separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson. And by and large, as the Gilded Age went on, the federal government is going to turn a blind eye to what is happening in the South, and we're going to have a, another few decades of relatively weak, ineffective presidents.